coming up on Foundation for Life with Dr. Waylon Bailey. I want us to live with the end in mind that we have given our best, that we have done all that we can do to make a difference in our community and to make a difference in our country and make a difference in our world by mapping out a future, a future that pleases God, a future that honors Him. Our scripture reading is Hebrews chapter 12, and I'll begin reading with verse 1. Uh, the, the writer of Hebrews uh, had some very special themes. He was writing to a group of people, Jewish believers, who were undergoing the first parts of persecution. And many of these were struggling with that persecution. So he's writing to them to keep their eyes on Jesus, to persevere to trust God, and you'll see that in Hebrews uh, chapter uh, 12 and beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the previous chapter uh, described many heroes of the faith, Old Testament saints who followed God. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. But he makes every indication that that would happen. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. I think what he's telling us in this passage of Scripture is everybody's going to endure hardship. Look on it as an opportunity to grow in Christ. Look on it as an opportunity to have your character made stronger. So endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Boy, this, this verse is going to resonate with you. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I put this sermon together earlier in the week, long before Friday night and the events of Paris. And yet this passage of Scripture seems to speak to our day and to the events of our world. What do we do in a world like this? How do you cope in a world like this? How do you thrive? Can the church thrive in a world like this? What do we do? How do we live? The Bible is two things I always say about it that is so amazing. One of them is it is so practical. 
it deals with real life. I, I know your friends, some of my friends, who never read the Bible. And so they think of it as a book of fairy tales, a book of sweet, nice stories. And that's all that they think about it. And they don't think of it that this is a practical word given to people who live in a practical world and who need the help of a practical God. So it always amazes me of how practical the Bible is and how it speaks to real life. The other thing that amazes me about the Scripture is that it is God's continuing word to us and that it helps us with all of the things that we have to experience in this world. You and I look at the world and we say, this is the worst time ever to live. And at least in our lifetimes, it is. It really is. Well, this passage of Scripture tells you how to have hope. This passage of Scripture tells you you can trust God. This passage of Scripture tells you that there is a way to live and that you don't have to live based on what you can do, but based on who God is. What the writer of Hebrews is doing us is telling us to live now with the end of your life in mind. I'd like for you to write that down because I think that is a key of how you live. Live with the end in mind. Assume that there is an end time and when that time comes and when I get to this other time in life, when I get there, I'm going to live now as if I am there. Let me give you a couple of practical ways to apply this, and I give them for my own life. A whole lot of people know what it's like to raise teenagers and kids. And we all know that when you're raising children, there are a lot of ups and downs, a lot of good days and bad days, a lot of Days in which you feel to yourself, man, we're going to make it. And then there are days when you say, I don't know if we can get through the day. There are a lot of times in life in which we wonder what we're going to do and how we're going to make it work. Well, Martha and I, we raised two daughters. So this applies if you're raising daughters. Here was the end in mind for us. We weren't really concerned about this week. And what's going on right now? But remember, your kids, their whole world is about a week long. This is it. Marty Williams told me one time, he said, Waylon, in the life of a teenager, a week is an eternity. So it's easy to get caught up in living this week. What am I doing today? And what's going to happen at 3 o'clock this afternoon in my life? easy to get caught up in that. So what Martha and I did was we, we kind of made this pact, and that is we were going to live with the end in mind, and the end in mind for us was going to be the day that I walked each daughter down the aisle and turned her over to a good, young, responsible man who would care for. And that became the end in mind. Now, we didn't know that we were going to keep worrying about them and praying for them for the rest of our lives. But that's the way it works as well. Let me give you another practical application from my life about how you live with the end in mind. Now, you know that I have a lot of people who have suggestions about how to lead a church. I have about 4,000 people who have good ideas. And I can tell you all kinds of things about that. But if I do that, we go around in this big circle, and that's all we do. And I make one person happy, but I make $39.99 unhappy. You know how that is. Everybody's got those kind of, I just got probably more than you do like that. 
But everybody's got people like that. So a long time ago, here's what I said to God. God, I know what's going to happen in the future. And I do. And so do you. Because this is what's going to happen in the future. The day is going to come when I will stand before Jesus and I will give an account of every idle word that I've spoken. And frankly, there's nobody here who's ever spoken as many words in your life as I have because I get to speak a lot of words. So I know that that day is going to come, and that day is going to come when I am going to stand before Jesus and give an account for my life. And can you imagine anything that he's going to ask me more significant than this? Waylon, what did you do with that church I gave you to lead? And what I want to do, I want to live with that end in mind. I want to live with that kind of understanding. When we live with the end in mind, here's what we do. We mark out the future. We we have an idea about the future. Now, we don't know the future. You don't know how your life's going to end. You don't know what your family's going to be like. You don't know what good or bad things are going to happen to you in life. There will be all of those. We don't know any of those things. But we all know that there will be an end to this life for us. We all know that we will stand before Jesus. We all know that we're going to give an account of our lives. We all know that we've got to get through today and this week. One of the the greatest stories I ever had was when I was standing at the Baptist bookstore, and that was what it was called in that day, and I was checking out. And I was just making idle conversation with a clerk behind the desk, and I said, what do you want to do? In life, she said, I want to make it to 5 o'clock this afternoon. (laughs) And most of us live that way. But what we have to do is live farther down the road. And so we mark out our future. We make plans. I believe this is where God is leading us. And we pray and we seek God and we mark out our future. Let's think about this church. Let's think about our future. We have these plans to build a new building because our Bible study space is completely full. That doesn't mean that there's not room for you in a classroom. There's always room for another person. There's always room for for two more people. We just don't have any more classrooms. All of them are filled up. And we put 14 or 15 and sometimes 1,600 people in all of these classes on a Sunday morning, what a tremendous thing that is. Amazing. Um, imagine that. 1,600 people studying the Bible at the generally the same time over a three-hour period of time. What a wonderful thing that is. People meeting together and spending time together. So we have this plan. Let's add more space so that we can, we can add more people and that more people can study the Bible together. So here's our plan. Here's our map for the future. Since we want to put the emphasis on the youngest generation, often called the homelanders, because they were born from 2001 to the present. The homelanders are Generation Z because the two generations before them were Gen X and Gen Y. And we've made this commitment. Let's let's get involved in their lives. This is going to be the biggest generation in American history. These are going to be the kids. They're going to be more than the baby boomers. They're going to influence everything they do simply because of the sheer size of this generation. So while we can't influence a lot of people, here are people we can influence. So let's do that. Let's, let's, put, let's build a new preschool building and a new children's building. And let's try to make it as attractive to preschoolers and children and their families as we can. And you know we're already way into all of this. Because we spend a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of money on Vacation Bible School. In Vacation Bible School, the majority of people who come to study the Bible at this church are not members of this church or don't attend this church. 
we have upward sports, upward recreation, and half the people, half the kids who play in those recreation leagues are not, don't attend this church. We do all kinds of things like that in which we, we want to reach this generation. I want us to live with the end in mind that we have given our best, that we have done all that we can do to make a difference in our community and to make a difference in our country and make a difference in our world by mapping out a future, a future that pleases God, a future that honors Him. How do we run this race? And that, In fact, that's the imagery that Paul used. You run a race. Well, if you run a race, you got to follow the race course. The writer of Hebrews says, run the race that is marked out for us. Follow that map that God has given us and let us give our best for his service. If you're going to live with the end in mind, you have to follow the leader. And you got to know who the leader is. And you got to make a commitment to the leader and you got to follow him. Look at the words that the writer of Hebrew gives us. Verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. And verse 3, consider him who endured such opposition. Talking about Jesus and his opposition on earth and his opposition as he was crucified. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. And the whole idea is that he's going to become the example for us. If he could endure all of the persecution from all of the, hit, the evil in the world, and that's what he did. He took our sin upon him. If he could do that, then we have an example who lives before us and who has shown us his way and who has given us his hope. So we have to follow the leader. We have to do things his way. So who is this leader? He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Think about it. How do, the, the, the guy who knows the most about the book is the guy who wrote the book. And Jesus wrote the book. He's the author. Isn't it amazing how we want to say, well, you know, I know more about writing the book than you, the author, know about writing the book. I, I know how this works. So I, I'm going to write about some science because I can write the book better than you can write the book. Now that would be arrogance and a whole lot of uh, amazing ways of thinking. And yet, do you know what we do? Jesus is the one who wrote the book. Here is how a person enters into the kingdom of heaven. And we want to say to him, you know, I really know about that book better than you do. And I think this is the way that it ought to work. What the passage of Scripture says is that Jesus is the author of our faith. But he didn't just begin it. He didn't just set it in purpose, in motion. He is the perfecter of our faith. He's the finisher. He, he started it and he finished it. And on the cross, remember, he said, he cried out, it is finished. He didn't say that to you and me. He said it to the Father. I was sent here for a purpose. And I've carried out that purpose. And I've completed it. I've done it exactly as you, the Father, wanted me to do. The way is open to heaven. Remember what happened? The, the veil of the temple was torn in two. A huge symbol that the way to God, because behind the veil, there was the Ark of the Covenant symbolizing the presence of God. So the presence of God is open. The way to God is open for us to enter in. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the one, this always amazes me. He's the one who endured the cross. But the preceding phrase says, who for the joy set before him. There's not a one of us here that doesn't know that the cross was a place of horror, not a place of joy. And yet somehow in the mind of Christ, somehow 
as he was in communion with the Father. He experienced the joy of being on the cross and the joy of being on the cross was of completing his work of salvation for you and me so that we could be his dear children. We have to follow the leader. We have to align ourselves with Christ. What would that be like? Well, it would be like this. It would be like our saying to God, I want to be holy as you are holy. Throughout the scripture, particularly in Leviticus, we're told again and again, you shall be holy as I am holy. Look at this passage of scripture that we read. It's about, it's about holiness. Actually, it's in the, next, uh, in the next part of the chapter chapter 12, and look at verse 14. Make every effort to, leave it, to live at peace with all men and to be holy. What, does, what does it mean to be holy? Well, two things. One of them is it's what God does for you. The word means to be set apart, to be sanctified. We get the word saint from that. It's to be sanctified, to be set apart. So part of it is God's work. He sets us apart for his work. That is to be holy. But also part of it is our work in that that we work with God in our sanctification to become as he is. We align ourselves with Christ. We emphasize holiness. Look at the rest of that phrase. It's on your sermon sheet. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. And look at this. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So it's imperative that we align ourselves with God and that we let him do his work in our lives. We must rely on what God can do and not simply on what we can do. Churches are notorious for doing what they can do instead of depending on what God wants to do in us. It's essential that we say to God, God, this is your church. Not Wayland's church, not my church, not our church. God, this is your church. It belongs to you. It is for you. God, what do you want to do in your church? What do you want to happen in the future? God, how is it that you want us to live with the end in mind? And we have to bring it down a little bit more personal and we have to ask ourselves, God, what do you want me? To do. Romans 8.11 is a fantastic passage of scripture because this is what it says. It says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the spirit that resides in you. So why is it that I keep trying to do things on my own? And why is it that the church keeps trying to do things on our own? Instead of relying on the Spirit of God, instead of depending on Him and letting Him do His great work within us. Here's what I do sometimes. What I do sometimes is I, I, I leave church and say I'm going to try harder. And I, you, you've heard me say this before. This is not the goal of having come to church. It's not for you to get in your car, look to your wife or your husband, look to your children and say, we're all going to work at this better. We're all going to do more. We're all going to be kinder to each other. We're all going to get along better. This week's going to be a better week. Now, I encourage you, if you you say those things, that's a good thing to say. But if you do what you can do based on your power, then that new resolution is going to last maybe 24 hours, but more like 12. But if you leave here today and get in the car and say, let's, all, let's turn our family over to Jesus. Let's invite Jesus to be in our house. Let's each one ask Jesus to make us kinder, more caring, more peaceful, less temper. 
less selfish. Then you get what God can do in a family. We have to rely on Him. And when we rely on Him, we're not relying on what we can see and touch. We're relying on the God of the universe. Who is God? Remember, they're writing to Hebrew Christians. And here's what the writer of Hebrews says. You've not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire. You're not coming to darkness, gloom, and storm. That was what happened on Mount Sinai. The whole mountain shook because of the presence of God. And and there was either a thunderstorm or a volcano. Biblical scholars don't know which it was. One of those was happening. God was present. There was darkness. There was gloom. They were afraid to go around the mountain. They were afraid to come into the presence of God. They saw the glory of God on the face of Moses, and they said, Moses, we can't handle this. So the writer of Hebrews says, you're not going to that. You're going to something better than that. You're going to something more permanent than that. You're going to something more real than that. So you haven't come to that mountain, but you've come to Mount Zion. You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to the city of the living God. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. You've come to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Man, I'm going to take that literally. That in heaven right now, my name in script, Waylon Bailey, is written. I'm going to take that literally. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to, this, to, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Now, if that's the God I worship, if that's the God I serve, Why am I moping in the past? And why aren't I living in the glorious future that God has mapped out for you and me and His church? Let us rely on God. Let us trust Him. Let us say unto Him, God, You are my Lord. And I thank you that my name is written